Dr. David Geyer is a double board certified orthopedic surgeon and sports medicine specialist, media medical expert, and host of the new podcast, The Media Pros Show. In his practice and on his online platform, he helps people feel and perform their best, regardless of age, injuries, or medical conditions. Having done well over 2,500 TV, radio, podcast, newspaper, magazine, and online publication interviews, he now coaches experts to help them grow their practices by getting interviewed as an expert on the media. We discuss why someone would want to even be on TV and print media to begin with, and how to get and stay there, and how COVID has actually made it easier to make such appearances. We also discuss podcasts and why we'd want to take his advice after debasing himself by appearing on a podcast like this. Just kidding. It was a great show, and even though I'm comfortable here in my basement where you can't see my bearded face, I'm considering making a foray into local news myself. He can be found at Dr. David Geyer, that's D-R, David, G-E-I-E-R, on all social media platforms, including a website, and his other website, MediaProsCoaching.com. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. It's not a secret that doctors have a hard time creating a professional-looking digital presence. Having a dynamic website, ranking in Google, or growing your volume of patient reviews are not easy tasks. We're too busy to figure it out on our own. Advice Media has been around for over 20 years and works with physicians to create a more brandable online image. Attract more patients, generate more calls and emails, enhance brand awareness, protect your online reputation, Schedule a demo with Advice Media and receive a $50 Amazon gift card just for chatting with them. Three in five patients will choose one provider over another because of a strong online presence. If that's the case, what is your online presence saying about you? Don't delay booking your demo today. Go to drpodcastnetwork.com slash advice media. That's drpodcastnetwork.com slash advice media. Dr. David Geyer, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Oh, I'm really excited. This is going to be a lot of fun. Why would I want to be featured on traditional media like TV or newspapers? What's in it for me? It really depends on what you're trying to achieve, but I'd give you two reasons. One is sort of the altruistic sort of why we go into medicine, which is, you know, to help people. And it's great to help people in your office. I know you really love that both office and surgery, and I certainly do too, but I'm helping one person at a time. Whereas when I do an interview on one of the TV stations here in Charleston, where I'm the medical expert, I'm reaching 5,000 people at the same time and able to help them in some way in their lives. So that's the one. The other, quite honestly, is I truly believe you can build your practice. Now, a lot of the doctors I talk to about this say, well, I've already got too many patients. I'm swamped as it is. But the beauty of it is you can really create your ideal patient and make your practice more of your ideal patients. If you have a certain little niche that you really like, that's the topic that you get out into the media and you talk about in the media, you become known for that. So in my world, sports medicine, there's a lot of different things that could be. But if I want to do just young athletes, I get everywhere that I can talking about youth sports injuries, that kind of thing. So you can really not just get overall more patients, but really more of the type of patients you like. What about for primary care, right? Like they're generalists. They see everybody. Yet I see a lot of primary care physicians featured on television, and a lot of them work for academic institutions, which means they're generally booked months out, right? Like where I am on Long Island, for me to get a primary care physician appointment when I first called up, and this was where I had a family member working there, took me six months to get an appointment. So it doesn't seem like that incentive might be there. So why would a primary care physician put themselves in that type of position? Yeah, academics, I can tell you, it might be a little different. I was in academics for eight years, and they usually, at least certainly mine did, and I know a lot of the other academic institutions in the Southeast were this way. They have very robust public relations and PR departments, basically, and they are always trying to get the institution's name out in the media. 
easily in my eight years there, I did 200 interviews in different media that came from public relations. So that may be part of it. There's also a little bit of an ego thing going on in academics. It's not necessarily about building patients. That's great if they do, but it's a little bit of a recognition type of thing in academics. There's all sorts of reasons. And I know a lot of physicians that just do it because they want to go to the grocery store and have people come up to them and say, hey, I saw you on TV or I heard you on the radio. So I get all of those things. I just think for most people, it's either going to be, I want to help more people or I want to get more patients and more of a certain type of patient. So you said that academic institutions, they generally have a PR person, right? Or a whole department. Yeah. Like they'll have eight to 10 people. Interface with the media as their profession, right? Yes. For those of us that don't have that infrastructure, how do we get our foot in the door? How do we get that type of exposure? Well, the first thing that I'm going to point out, and this is probably something we'll come back to in whatever we talk about, because the bottom line is that it's not about just a one-off interview. It's about building relationships, whether that's writers for online publications, reporters and journalists for newspapers or magazines, or producers for radio and TV shows, because you want to be able to be asked back over and over again. The value of the media is not just being in something once, it's being seen and heard and read over and over again. So you sort of become synonymous. You just become a known person. They get to know who you are. And to build those relationships, you know, that's what your goal is. And so you have to sort of look at it as how you can help that producer, that writer, that journalist, that radio show host. And so we have way more information than any of these media outlets are going to know, but we have to show them that, hey, we can help you create content that's going to get listens or it's going to get views. And obviously that helps the public. And so it's getting your foot out, be it through finding their emails and contacting them and say, hey, I read your piece in whatever. I am an expert on this. You might want to think about a story about that. That's sort of a very general way to do it, but it's showing how you can help them create content that gets more views, more listens, things like that. And those relationships pay off huge. Just for perspective, I'm in Charleston, South Carolina, but I did a TV interview in Charlotte, North Carolina earlier today. Some NFL player reportedly killed an ER doctor and his family and then committed suicide. The thought is it's CTE from his football days, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. The reason I got that, even though there's a huge sports medicine group in Charlotte, is because I built relationships with that producer and did a lot of interviews for them during COVID. So nine months later, they come back to me for this. That's what you're really trying to achieve. And when you start thinking about reaching out, it's not just a one-time thing. It's relationships that get you seen and listened and used over and over again. So how do you get that first opportunity? Fine. Once you get it, you want to knock it out of the park. You want to make sure you're knowledgeable, you're prepared, you're engaging so that they know, oh, this is someone that everyone's going to want to listen to because they were entertaining and engaging as well as just informative. But like, how do you get that first? You said you just cold email them? Well, yeah, but there's a little bit of a strategy. It's not just random. First, you have to decide, and this is something with some of the physicians I work with, is you figure out what your topic is, what your sort of message is going to be and what publications and what media are going to be best for that. So some things are going to be better for TV. Some are going to be better for radio. Some are going to be better for newspaper, that kind of thing. And then you do research and we all watch the TV or have it on in the background sometimes, or we read various local newspapers, things like that, the magazines in the area. So what you're doing when you're going through these media and trying to say, all right, I want to be on TV. Let's just say that I decide that my message is best for local TV. Then I'm going to watch each of the stations in my town. And you can find all these online now. You don't actually have to be at home on your TV. And you look for, in my case, who the health reporters are on the different stations and then what stories they're talking about. And if there's one that's close to what I'm doing, then I figure out who he or she is, how to contact that person, say, hey, I really liked your story on high school knee injuries because they've been putting it artificial turf in all the football stadiums, for instance. I do sports medicine and orthopedic surgery, and I could talk about X, Y, Z, and then approach it that way so that they know that you're a fit for them, that you've done your research and know what they talk about and then you reach out with your idea. And that's where those relationships start. If you just cold email somebody, especially if it's not a health reporter. I'm an ear, nose, and throat doctor. If you have any questions about ears, noses, or throats, give me a call. Like, yeah, right. that's not going to work out. 
The problem you're going to go, if you don't do your research, is you're going to get a business reporter or you're going to get a breaking crime news reporter. That isn't going to do you any good. So it's a little bit of research up front. But I will tell you that once you put the system in place, I don't do this, but I know how to do it. I could train a high school kid to do a lot of that background research. And even if you got good at it, have them pitch those reporters, almost become your little press secretary or publicist. And then all you're having to do is do the media media interviews. And that can be a great thing to do, but it requires a system. You have to show these journalists, these reporters that you're a fit for them and that you can help them. And where do you get their contact information? I notice on Twitter, a lot of them actually have their email addresses on their Twitter, whatever account heading. Where have you found them? And a lot of them have personal websites too, and they'll have contact forms or email addresses there. Sometimes in the case of TV, the TV stations on like the Meet the News team will have it there. For online publications and newspapers on the website, a lot of times it'll be at the end of the article, or if you click on the hyperlink, the writer's name, and if you click on it, it'll take to sort of a bio page that has their contact information. At that, use things like LinkedIn. You can usually find ways to find people that way. And this sounds sleazy, but it's really not. If you can find anybody's email address, the naming formula is going to be the same for all of those. So if it's dguyer at abc.com, then if I'm trying to get you, it's probably going to be bblock at abc.com. Yeah, people do that with us all the time. That works really well. They're emailing us in medicine because they figured out how the hospital email address system works. And they know your first and last name. So they pitch you with malpractice insurance or (laughs) life insurance or something like that. Yeah, we get those emails all the time because someone cracked the code. Yeah. If you're a little resourceful, you can find just about anybody. It's trying to get New York and LA and CNN, Fox News. It's maybe one out of four that I can't find an email address or figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. Again, you got to have a reason for reaching out to them. But then once you have a way to do it, it may not work the first time, but if you stick with it every so often, eventually they'll use you. So that sounds like a lot of overhead. How do we decide if it's going to be worth the investment? There are some specialties that are reimbursed, particularly some better than others for orthopedics. You guys do well with surgery. Neurosurgeons do well with surgery. Actually for ENT, we do better in the office than we do in the operating room. So how do we figure out whether it's worth it or not to put in all that work? Yeah, you're right. You're either going to pay with money, i.e. hiring a publicist to do all this for you, unless you're in academics and have a PR department, or yeah, you're probably going to put in more time. It's not for everybody. There's no question. That's why there's so few people that do it on a consistency level. I really like it is the bottom line of why I do this as much as I do. But having said that, if you're trying to build a specific niche practice, let me say that what I have seen talking to not just doctors, you know, accountants, and attorneys and all, there seem to be people that are sort of want to build a certain niche or they're at a point in their career where, hey, look, I'm going to step back a little bit and not maybe work 10 hours a day, five days a week and take call. I'll do a little bit less. And then the media is something that they can add into their practice. The other physicians that I'm seeing pop up in the media more, and I don't know if this is good or bad, are the ones that have some sort of cash-based practice, whether it's functional medicine, or they do more of the supplements and hormones type of things, or they've just got the biologics, the PRP and stem cells, things that are big in our world are becoming big. I'm noticing those physicians on TV more. And so they probably do have a vested interest in using the media to build their practices. I'm not sure where I should go with that statement, but there are a couple (laughs) places that I want to go and it may alienate some of my audience members, but I guess we'll save that for another podcast. Yeah, But the publicist can be a good route. I talked about instead of putting the work in, you can hire somebody that does all of that. And then they just get you interviews. I did that twice years and years ago, and I'm not a big fan of it, but it can work. And then my publisher for my book, hired a publicist for getting promotion for the book. It can be helpful if you're trying to build your practice in a certain certain town, publicists are good at getting you volume interviews. It may be an interview on a radio station in Oklahoma City, and then it may be a newspaper in Seattle. And so depending on where you are, that may or may not be helpful. It's probably helpful in a credibility sense that if you put all these links on your websites and put out on social media, hey, check out my article with the Seattle Times or whatever their newspaper is, there is some credibility that comes with that. But you're going to pay a lot of money for a publicist. 
it's you know anywhere from three to ten thousand dollars a month. So unless you've got a way to work with them that's going to become worth it, that's probably not where I would start. But if you just to test the work, that's sort of a way around the outreach. All right. Is there any exposure that should be avoided, or is all press good press? I've never been a huge believer in the all press is good press. I feel like there's a little bit of a fine line where you need to stay in your lane and gradually branch out to a point that you're doing maybe more topics in the media than just one little message, but stick within things you know. I would be real hesitant. And once you especially start doing some interviews and other reporters and writers see your name and stuff, then they'll start approaching you and you don't even know who they are. If the topic is something you're not really comfortable with, I'm not sure I would try to do that. I certainly wouldn't wing it. If you're going to do it, either research it or talk to a physician in that specialty and kind of find out as much as you can. But I feel like the better answer, if something like that happens to you, is just to tell that writer or reporter, hey, you know, I'm not really comfortable with that topic. I don't know that much about it, but I can give you a couple names and they may be great. They will really respect that and be more likely to come back to you down the road than if you try to wing it. It and it's pretty clear you don't know much about that topic. Got it. So avoid talking about things where you're not an expert. But what about, I don't know if there's an equivalent of like info wars, right? Like something that's going to besmirch your reputation for appearing on it. Or is that even a thing when it comes to this type of material? I don't know that there's a publication or a media that would worry me necessarily. I do feel like you a lot of you'll know the topic. It, it'd be really rare for them to say, "Hey, we want you on," and you have no idea what it is. And so you can get a sense if they're hoping that you're going to talk about something controversial, whether it's something in the mainstream media, something some celebrity did, and they want somebody to come on and crush it. And COVID was very political too, and you could sometimes sense when a TV show producer had sort of an agenda. And so then you can sort of either massage your answers a certain way to be non-controversial, or if you need to just say, hey, come up with a conflict and say, hey, I'd love to do it. I just can't do it today because I've got this if you really feel like it's going to be bad. But I haven't really seen that much gotcha journalism with doctors. The media still highly respects physicians. I'm not sure that just inherently there's anywhere that I would avoid. What about once you're invited, how do you avoid being misquoted or taken out of context? Let's say there's a little snippet and that's what they decide to put on. And, and but before you said it, you prefaced it with, you know, in all circumstances, this doesn't apply. And then, and then that's the only part that they take. The funny thing about this question is that it's a fear of almost every doctor I've ever talked to about the media, that they're worried about how it's going to come across. And let me start with something you shouldn't do, and then we can work to maybe how I would address that. The one thing physicians want to do is they want to say, hey, once you write your article, let's just say it's magazine, newspaper, online publication, once you write it, will you send it to me so I can make sure it's all right? That isn't going to work. One, they're way too busy. They're just not going to do it. Sometimes these articles have to go out almost immediately, or it may be, be three weeks later and they forget it. And again, you're trying to develop relationships. You don't want to give them any extra work. But most interviews now, and again, we're going to stick with print for a second, they're recorded. Almost every journalist now, because they just can't write or type fast enough while you're talking. So they'll ask you, hey, can I record this? I can't tell you that I've been misquoted on a recorded interview much at all. So I'm not as worried about that. And then the other thing that I would do, because again, they're going to take care of the recording, is just don't wing it. Go into your interview with a message, and this is something that I've worked a lot in my media to try to get better at, what your overall message is going to be, and then two or three talking points that are going to help people. And if they ask something that I'm going to get out there, I say something, well, that is not something that I really can comment much about, but what I would say, and then pivot to one of your points, where you get in trouble is when these, is there anything else you'd like to add and you want to look smart or something like that, and you get off topic, that's where people get in a lot of trouble. But if you go into the interview with a message and two or three talking points, sort of an agenda, you're not going to run that much risk of saying something that gets you too far away from home. You're like a politician. There's what they want to say. 
A little bit, but I don't look at it as saying non-judgmental stuff. I have things that I want the public to know in each interview, whatever the medium is. And so if he asks some question that I either don't feel comfortable with or could go take it in a way that's going to get, I think, the wrong message, you learn to pivot. It's politics a little bit, but as physicians, yeah, I think we would do harm if we said something that was actually the opposite of what we believed. And so you just have to make sure you stick on message. You're the expert, right? So if they give you a topic to talk about, it's your job to navigate the interview in such a way that the important points are hit. Yeah. So even if it's not exactly answering the question, answer it in the way that you're getting the important material out there. And if you have that established beforehand, then you're less likely to stumble. You're less likely to make a mistake. That's what politicians do, right? Like they know the few messages that they want to get out before the interview even starts, before the debate even starts. So even if it doesn't really answer the question, they want to get that material out there. And it's the same thing for us. It's just a different reason. Yeah, We do it because we want to make sure that good, reliable, important information is what's getting out there. And one other trick, because I agree with that completely, but where physicians struggle a little bit and the reporters struggle with what we say, and this, to be fair, is our problem, not theirs, is that we went to school for a long time. We went to medical school. We did residencies, sometimes fellowships. We know a lot, but we, a lot of times, either intentionally try to show it by using big, fancy technical words, or that's how we talk normally. And we have to remember that the viewer, the listener, whoever doesn't have that medical knowledge, but neither does the writer or reporter. And it's not dumbing down. It's explaining it in ways that people can use. And so if you go into that with the mindset of explaining it in a way that is accurate, but makes sense, the reporter is not going to have to do that themselves because you may be telling them completely accurate information. But if you do it all technical, the reporter is going to have to find a way to make it, you know, sort of for everybody, him or herself. And that's where you can get into trouble. So do them a favor by explaining it in English, in normal language, and not something you'd see in a medical textbook. What are some things that when you watch other physicians on the news or read them in the newspaper, make you cringe? (laughs) What are some of the things that you want to see us stop doing? That's far and away the biggest one. I remember early in COVID, there was an infectious disease doctor, CNN or Fox News. I don't remember where it was. And he kept using the term R not. To be fair, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, but I don't deal in R not. The only reason I knew what that was, is, you know, all my research for my COVID interviews, you know, the number of people that if you get a virus, the number of people that you turn around and infect. He never explained what R not was. And I doubt there was a hundred people in the viewing audience, the millions of people watching that had any idea what he was talking about. So that would be one. The other one I think is to show not to be stiff as a board, show a little bit of personality. I think that there's a lot of value in not being a robot, coming off as a person, somebody compassionate and caring, especially locally. I think that's really important. I feel like whether they're nervous or they want to look real professional, physicians a lot of times come across as not not having any personality. And especially if you're trying to build a practice or get certain types of patients, that personality is what's going to attract those people to you. So be okay being a little playful. A lot of times locally, they'll give you playful questions sometimes and show a little bit of personality. That would be something that I don't see enough physicians doing well. Do you think there's any benefit to having formal media training? If this is what we're looking to get into? I do. I'm going to embarrass myself, so I won't give you a number, but the amount of money I've spent on media coaches and training courses and all that, yeah, I mean, it's the reason I don't feel like I'm as good as some of the people on CNN and Fox News, the political people, but I feel like I've gotten really good, but it's because I've worked with people that really showed me how to do it better. There's usually two types of media training. There's the training that the publicist will do, which is how to be good on camera or how to be good on the radio, whatever it is, because they don't want you to know how to get the interviews. They want you to hire them to do that. But then there's also the media coaches that don't really focus on how good you are media wise in your interviews. They're focused on to teach you how to get interviews. And so those are both skills that are really important to learn if you're going to do this. And so you want to look for somebody. I do it and and I'm certainly happy to help people, but you need both sets of skills. You don't want to find a great system to get interviews and then you're terrible in them. If you're great in them, but aren't getting any interviews, that doesn't help you either. So my next question was going to be, how do you find a proficient trainer? And I guess the answer is 
davidgeyer.com. It really gets into, like I say, there are people that kind of do it really gets to which of those skills you want. Most of my media coaches over the years have been the how to be great on camera, radio, that kind of thing, you know, working on messaging, working on body mannerisms, voice, the things you know that are really important. It really is what you're going for as far as and what skills you need. If you're just starting out, then you know you probably focus a little bit on how to be good, just proficient enough that if you get something that you're they, they're likely to ask you back. And then once you get a few, start putting the mechanisms in place to get more interviews. What are some aesthetic tips? Because we've talked about some messaging so far when you do get it, but how do you make sure that you look and sound good? Because if this does end up on a YouTube video at some point, people will be able to see. But for the podcast listeners, I look green and washed out right now. And I've got like falling curtains behind me that are good for the sound, but it doesn't look so good. Whereas he's got bookcase behind him with fitting of an orthopedic surgeon. He's got football, basketball, it's signed. He's got books. He's got pictures. I think you're missing a plant. <laughs> you are missing a plant. I think you could benefit from a plant back there, but I've seen enough of these Zoom interviews. So what are some aesthetic tips? I think a few things. There's the background, which is important. And then there's a setup technically. And so the background is really what you want to project. So like you mentioned, some of the sports paraphernalia, I do orthopedic surgery and sports medicine. So that makes sense for me. It wouldn't make sense necessarily for you and what you do. And for some people that may be putting a diploma or two on the wall behind them, like you say, something with color is really helpful, whether that's a painting or a plant that can be really good. You don't want just a solid white background, which is what I'm seeing way too many physicians when they're doing Skype and Zoom interviews. So don't do that. But the other thing you want to think about before the interview is how you do it. So it's going to be Zoom or Skype almost exclusively. And you and I talked about this off camera. The problem is a lot of us use our laptops. The laptop is going to usually be fairly low compared to a desktop monitor and where the webcam is. And so you're going to be looking down. And so the viewer is looking up your nose. So if you need to use a laptop, put three or four books to get the webcam at the level of your eyes. So you're looking straight ahead and then you want to have good lighting behind the camera. Those two things will make you better than 95% of the doctors on TV right now. But whatever it is, yeah, you want the webcam at the level of your eyes, not way lower. And it helps though, I think, to have it attached to your laptop because you're going to be looking at your laptop. And so if you just elevate the camera, now there's a significant distance between your camera and the other person. And it's just so unnatural to be looking far away from where the person is. I think it's a little distracting. So actually elevating the whole laptop instead of just taking the camera and putting that in a different place. Because yeah. you've managed to look in the camera this entire time. And yeah. I find it really hard to do that. Oh, it's a skill and you beat me to it. That's the other thing that I think because we just don't do a lot of this. You got to do everything you can not to look at the monitor. And especially if it's a live interview where you can see the host. Because then what the viewer is seeing is they're seeing you looking at the floor. And that looks, I'm not going to say I'm professional, but it looks like you're nervous and unconfident. They don't realize that you're looking at the host on your monitor. They think you're looking down and not talking to them. So I used to do this. I don't have them anymore, but Amazon made these little post-it notes that were in the shape of an arrow. And I used to put them pointing at my webcam so I would look at that and not at the monitor. Yeah. It's a skill, but you can practice it on Zoom and Skype meetings that aren't media interviews and get in the habit of just looking at the camera and it becomes natural pretty quickly. That also means you can't be checking email during those meetings and doing other work. I hate meetings. So yeah, I am the worst at that. Zoom and Skype has been a problem in that sense because it's much harder to uh, multitask. So how has COVID changed everything? Because I would imagine now that you don't actually have to go to the studio it gives one a lot more competition for spots because now suddenly everyone's available, but two, it allows you to more easily have access to you. So you're more available, little pluses and minuses. How has that worked out? 
There's been some good and bad. You and I were talking off camera. I'm the medical expert now for two TV news stations here in Charleston, South Carolina. Wait, sorry, you're the orthopedic expert or the medical expert? Medical expert. I talk about anything. When Alex Trebek had died of pancreatic cancer, when Donald Trump had COVID, I do those. Now, I didn't start there. I started with just health and wellness that was in the fitness and nutrition type world that was pretty close. And then I branched out. But I used COVID as an opportunity because... I know there's opportunity for a lot of physicians, but stations couldn't get anybody. And so I filled a void. Obviously, my two stations here knew me, but I immediately leveraged that to get five or six other stations throughout the country. And it's now been up to 17 different states where I've built relationships. But like the Charlotte one today was one that I did 20 or so interviews on COVID early in 2020. And just because they couldn't get anybody, you can't get into the studios in most places now, but you can do Zoom and Skype. But the key is you've got to be available when they need you. You can't say, yeah, I'd love to do it. How about next Thursday afternoon? It doesn't work that way. You've got to work to their schedule. But if you can do that and you can do Skype and Zoom almost anywhere, depending on your internet connection, you will be in demand if they know you and that you come through for them when they need you. So there's a lot of availability in theory, but there aren't many physicians that are really doing it. Interesting. For everyone who's listening, fill those voids. Yeah, absolutely. Just my experience with COVID, because I've been on half the country now, the interviews run all over the place. Local stations need doctors to talk. Like I said, Alex Trebek dies of pancreatic cancer. The public wants to know what pancreatic cancer is. There is an absolute void and somebody that can explain it. I promise in every city of every person listening to this, they need people. Very few stations locally have dedicated medical experts. I'm rare in that sense, and only because I sort of pushed for it. But there is a huge opportunity. Same with radio, not the music stations, but the talk radio stations that do news badly need people to do this kind of thing. But yeah, there's opportunity out there. I promise you, it doesn't matter. Maybe New York might be a little more competitive, maybe New York City. But I bet somebody could break in on you know Fox 5 up there or NBC4, just like they could here in Charleston, South Carolina. I'll give it a try. Yeah. The trick is the big cities also have the academic medical centers that have very robust PR departments. That's a little tricky. Whereas if you're in Tulsa, Oklahoma, it's going to be a little bit easier. Yeah, I'm competing against Northwell, which I think they're the biggest employer in the state. And then Mount Sinai, NYU, right. Montefiore, Columbia yeah. Cornell. That's New tough. York City would be a little bit trickier. So then you have to get more creative. Maybe it's not local TV. Again, it depends a little bit on what you're trying to do. But radio, most public relations departments for big hospital corporations or academic centers are going to focus on TV. So there are plenty of other opportunities. But you're right, the big TV cities, the big TV markets, maybe a little trickier. Yeah. There's a whole Long Island TV station. And actually, to your point, if we're not the ones on TV, it's going to be someone else. I remember sitting in the office and one of my patients had the TV on because we have them for when they're waiting for us. And up pops something about local bee honey working to help allergies. It was a nurse practitioner talking about if your allergies bother you, eating some local bee honey, it exposes you to the as realistic as that might sound to all our viewers. I knew it's garbage. It is not medicine. It's not physiologic. And we have an allergist in our office. We <laughs> give allergy shots. So that misinformation hurts me economically and hurts the patients. So if you're not the one out there doing the talking and someone else is, they might be giving garbage information. And that actually would be a third great reason to do this. So we talked about just helping more people altruistically. We talked about growing your practice, getting the ideal patient, but there is a huge need. And I know when I was doing the weekly segments before I started doing, now I'm on every day on these two stations, but when I was doing weekly and I was coming into the studio, half of the time, the topics would be something that they wanted to debunk really. It was these different health claims and this sounds crazy. There is an absolute need in the media for that. So if you're just going on refuting stuff that you're reading, all you have to do is follow celebrities on Instagram or in People Magazine, see all kinds of nonsense health things. If you just you know copy that, send it to a reporter and say, hey, this is what's out there. I can tell you the truth about this. You're going to generate interest without a doubt. A personal passion of mine. 
I'm not one of the skeptics. There's this whole like skeptic movement, skeptical raptor or skeptic raptors, yeah. this whole blog. It's I'm not one of them. Great respect for them. And actually I plan on having them on the podcast at some point. But yeah, if you're not giving the information, it might be someone else who's given garbage information. So another great reason to do it. So what about podcasts? Does anyone actually listen to, does <laughs> anyone actually listen to podcasts? Who are these podcasters and can they be trusted? Why would you go on a podcast? Because what you're doing right now is you're working on two local stations, right? right. So news is local, but podcasts aren't. They're national, they're international. So what's the advantage of going on a show like mine where there's no particular local allegiance or audience? And it may not be necessarily medical podcast per se, but a lot of cities have city local podcasts. Not too long ago, I was on the Healthy Charleston podcast that a PT group does and they interviewed gym owners and things like that. So there are some ways to do it local, but you're right. Most podcasts are not. One thing I said earlier about credibility is where I really feel like podcasts might help you. Let's just take the trying to build your practice. You're right. I'm not going to get patients from Long Island. It's just not going to happen. But what I can do with this interview, or if I'm on any other podcast, is I can put that audio on my website. I can tweet about it. I can put Facebook posts, say, hey, check out my interview with this. And it builds credibility. You put it on your media page, on your website, and patients, when they're finding out more about you, see that, oh, he was featured on this podcast. He must be an expert in his field. Plus, on top of anything, all those social media things and podcast is a social media, but especially if you tweet it and put it on Facebook and things, help your search rankings. Uh, and that can be really helpful. Or not your search rankings, but those appear in, in Google searches for your name. So I think there's tons of great reasons. And the great thing about podcasts, yes, they may be niche, but those are people that are loyal to that topic. They really care about that. That topic. So if you find one that you're a good fit for, yeah, you may only reach 100 or 200 people, but those are 100 and 200 people that deeply care about that topic. When I'm talking to 5,000 people on local TV, maybe 100 care about whatever I'm talking about. So I think that there is value. It just may not be directly leading to patients right then and there. So how do you know which podcast to go on? Like, how do you make sure you're ones that are on your target audience, how do you make sure they don't just have a pretty picture and no audience behind them, that there's nobody actually downloading or the host tends to interrupt a lot <laughs> yeah. or they're poorly prepared or they tend to push pseudoscience and so you may right. not want to be associated with them. How do you know which ones you want to appear on and how do you know which ones yeah. maybe raise some red flags? First thing I would do is I'd do my research and listen to two or three episodes. Just do whether it's Apple or Spotify or whatever your podcast directory is, search for podcasts, even make a list and then listen to an episode or two driving to work, an episode or two of each and maybe not driving, but when you can take notes and yeah, absolutely avoid the pseudoscience or the ones that you feel like it's just going to be you arguing with the host. That's never Ever really fruitful. As far as the number of listeners, that's really tricky. There aren't great ways for an outsider to estimate that. What is it, new and noteworthy or whatever it is on Apple Podcasts? Those aren't necessarily just listens. There's a lot of things that go into what pops up as hot or whatever they call it. So you can do uh, rankings of an overall website and get an estimate of how many people go to that website. There's an Alexa service that does that for free, but I don't typically worry too much about it. I'm really more focused on, is it a good fit, my topic and what I talk about? And does the show host sound like somebody that would be fun to talk to? Because it is, it's a conversation. You're in people's heads. They're listening to two people have a conversation. And so if it feels like a good fit, it's probably worth it, even if they only have 50 or hundred listeners. Fantastic. So tell us where we can find you. Tell us about your podcast, where we yeah. can find it, your coaching and your book. Yeah, the obviously I care about this a ton, way more than most people, but I live and breathe this and I love helping doctors, especially I get people in other specialties, chiropractors apparently love being in the media, I'm finding out because that's who I'm hearing a lot from, whether it's accountants or attorneys or other people, but I really love helping physicians. And so even if you don't want in depth things, if you want just some simple things up my podcast, the media pros show every week I do is five to 12 minutes, one tip 
that by the time you get to work, you have a strategy you can implement right away. Like the one that published Monday as we're filming this, I talked about you should never, ever use a cell phone for a radio interview. And I gave a few reasons why. So very simple, just it's on anywhere you can find podcasts, the Media Pros Show. And then the website is mediaproscoaching.com. I would love, there's a form or a button on there that you can click and I'm happy to talk for 30, 45 minutes, no price, no fee, no obligation, anything. Just if we can figure out what you're trying to achieve and maybe I can give you two or three places to start I would love to do that. As far as my book, it's probably I, maybe not be for everybody. I'm a huge sports guy. I do sports medicine. So I wrote a book that came out in 2017. It's on Amazon, Barnes and Noble called That's Gotta Hurt, The Injuries That Change Sports Forever. And it's 13 stories of things that either, you know, injuries that led to new rules or it led to new equipment. It led to new surgeries or medical techniques that radically changed different sports. It's really interesting if you are interested in some of the after effects of some of the injuries that we all kind of know CTE and that kind of thing, but knowing the story of Dave Dewerson and how he committed suicide and how that led to what's going on today in the brain research. It's really interesting. Obviously, I'm really passionate about it. If it's not for you, no worries. But if I can help in the media world, certainly reach out. What was that website one more time? Mediaproscoaching.com? Yeah, mediaproscoaching.com. Excellent. The show is the Media Pros Show. David Geyer, thank you so much for your time. This was a great interview. Oh, completely loved it. This was great and look forward to working with you much more in the future. One last thing before we go. Remember Advice Media? Don't forget to schedule a demo with them to receive a $50 gift card and strategic insight on what your current online presence is doing or not doing for you. Contact Advice Media at drpodcastnetwork.com slash advice media. Again, drpodcastnetwork.com slash advice media. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.